The Holy Gospel according to John, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one about whom I said, He who comes after me is really greater than me because he existed before me. Even I didn't recognize him, but I came baptizing with water so that he might be made known to Israel. John testified, I saw the Spirit coming down from heaven like a dove, and it rested on him. Even I didn't recognize him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, The one on whom you see the Spirit coming down and resting is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this one is God's Son. The next day, John was standing again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus walking along, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he asked, What are you looking for? They said, Rabbi, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? He replied, come and see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two disciples who heard what John said and followed Jesus was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. He led him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So as long as I can remember, I've had a desire to learn more about God and Jesus, about the stories of our faith, right? And I'm sure that that's likely true for most, probably all of you who are here at Zoom, here in the building today. You know, this is a day and age where we don't come to church anymore because it's the thing that's expected of us. We are here because we want to nurture our faith, because we have that curiosity, that desire to, to know God, to be in relationship with God. So that was something that I identify in myself. I can remember from a young age, being the kid that really liked Sunday school, um, that liked confirmation, Bible study, youth group. Um, I think it's that curiosity, certainly, that led me here to this place, to eventually becoming a pastor. Uh, I can remember starting seminary, really excited to nurture that curiosity, right? I had a lot of questions, and I wanted answers to those questions, and some of those really hard questions about faith and life, right? Like, big questions. Who is God? How can God be three and yet one? How can God be both human and divine, and what does all of that even really mean or matter? Why is there so much suffering in the world? And what does the Bible have to teach us about life and death, about life after death? For me, seminary was a wonderful time. It was an exciting time of deep learning of being with others who are also wrestling with these same questions. And I do still remember also very clearly at the end of my studies, finishing up that time with a, a sense of dread, I guess. Because even after having all of that theological training, um, planning to be out in the parish as, as one who is the one with, with the training and the knowledge, um, I didn't feel that I had all the answers to those hardest questions, right? And our professors would tell us that's not our job, right? It's not your job to have all the answers. 
But that doesn't necessarily make it e any easier, right? When you're going out to interview with congregations, wondering whether someone might put you on the spot with a really tough question and that I would be left fumbling for, for words, right? Not knowing how to answer it. And I will confess that I still struggle some days with not having all the answers to the hard questions of faith that I wish I had. But certainly time and experience has helped me come to see that my professors will, really were right. For pastors and for all people of faith, it's not our job and it's not actually possible to have all the answers. And I know for me, one of the things that has helped me the most with accepting this is realizing that I'm in good company. When Jesus asks Andrew and this other disciple whose, whose name is not given, when he asks them why they're following him, he says, who are you looking for? Did you notice that like, they don't really have a very good answer? I mean, they don't answer that question. I don't know if they're you know, put on the spot and they're fumbling to say anything. Um, when Jesus asks them, who are you looking for? Well, they say, where are you staying? And I can, I can just see them maybe kicking themselves <laughs> for asking a dumb question. Maybe it's likely not the first impression they wanted to make on this person who they have been told is the Lamb of God, right? The one who takes away the sin of the world. But Jesus calls them to come with him. Our reading today ends with, with Jesus calling Andrew and that unnamed disciple, and then we hear about Peter being called. But if we read on, beyond where I stopped this morning, we see that Jesus actually goes out again the next day and continues to call disciples. He meets Philip, and Philip goes out and brings in his friend Nathaniel. And I want to talk for just a moment about Nathaniel. I don't know if that's a disciple or a person that we really know much about. Um, Nathaniel, we are told, is a student of the scriptures. And so his interest is piqued when Philip comes and tells him that they've found the one, the one about whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote about. So Nathaniel is intrigued, but he, he's also taken aback because what surprises him is that when Philip tells him they've found the one, the one is Jesus from a place called Nazareth. And that is just almost too much for Nathaniel to take in to believe because he knows the Messiah can't come from Nazareth. That's uh, what it has been said in scripture. Um, and he even wonders out loud, can anything good come from Nazareth? Right? He thinks that he had an answer, but this answer he thought that he could hold on to, this idea that the Messiah couldn't come from Nazareth, well, that answer turned out to be wrong. So for me, these confused and curious disciples, Andrew and Peter and Philip and Nathaniel and the ones who aren't named, they're a comforting reminder that the life of faith is about the search for meaning and purpose and connection. And it's often not about all um, getting all the answers. Faith is more about the questions, and the journey. Because we know what does Jesus say when Andrew and the unnamed disciple ask him where he's staying? Well, he could have just told them the address or the name of whoever's house it was, but he doesn't. He invites them to come. Come and see. And that invitation, it spreads. When Jesus asked Philip to come and follow him, well, Philip goes and invites his friend Nathaniel, who, as I said, right, has these doubts, these, these wonderings. Well, Philip gives that same invitation to Nathaniel. Come and see. Just come and check it out for yourself. Bring your questions and your doubts. You come and see who Jesus is. The life of following Jesus, this life of discipleship, is an invitation to be in relationship. It's an invitation to do life together. Jesus invites the disciples to take a journey with him, to sit with him and listen, to see miracles, to eat together and live together and be friends. Jesus promises that if they come with him, they will see great things, that in him they will encounter God, 
that in him they will come to know God more deeply. And they will come to find some answers, but Jesus doesn't promise all the answers. So often we talk about faith as if it's knowing things about God, right? But faith is not just what we think or believe about God. Faith is a relationship of trust with God. And as with any relationship, right, as we grow and change and evolve, we know that our relationships, our faith, will grow and change and evolve. Faith is not about having all the answers to life's mysteries. Faith is simply answering that invitation to come and see, to come and sit with the scriptures so that we can hear God's living word spoken in our time and place. To come and pray so that we might listen for God's presence and action in our lives and in the world. To come and worship so that we might see Jesus revealed to us in prayer and music and the sacraments. To come and serve so that we might see Jesus revealed in acts of compassion and love, of giving and receiving. To invite others to come and see what church is all about, who God is and what Jesus is like. And not to worry that we have to have all the answers to those hard questions. Our job is to extend the invitation to invite others like Jesus did to come and see, trusting that together the Spirit will help us learn and grow and deepen in faith. We often do make faith about holding certain beliefs beliefs about who God is, about what God is like, and that has a place, but that's not where Jesus starts. Jesus begins with that invitation to come and see. My hope is that you will hear Jesus's call as an invitation to you, as an invitation to nurture your relationship with God this year and beyond throughout the whole of your life. And so may that, may that be so. May we hear Jesus' call to each one of us. Come and see. May the Spirit give us courage and curiosity to answer that call. For who knows what wonderful and unexpected places it may lead us. Amen. Our hymn of the day is number 798, Will You Come and Follow Me? I'll invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together. <clears throat> Thank you. 